Great, thanks. <laughs> no, this is okay, so um, now we're going to the other end of the spectrum, having gone from mild asthma to really severe asthma in children and the use of biologics. And um, what I'd like to discuss here is when would you consider a biologic in a child? Um, how do you work out whether they need one or not? How do you choose a biologic? If you know the child in front of you needs one, how do you choose it? What are the biomarkers for children? How do they work in children? Do we even know anything about that? Which biologics are licensed for use in children? And then what's the evidence that they actually work in children? Have we got trials in children for biologics? And um, you'll be surprised uh, uh, to see the data, I think. So which child should we be considering for a biologic? Well. I think what we have to remember is uh, the, the child that we're worried about is the child who has persistent poor asthma control despite having been prescribed maximal therapy, high dose inhaled steroids, plus um, con other controller therapies like long acting beta agonists, theophylline, leukotriene receptor antagonists. They've been prescribed loads of treatment, but despite that, and you're at the top end, they've still got poor control with frequent exacerbations and uh, frequent symptoms. Now, when you're faced with these children, the first thing you have to do, which is what essentially what I talked about in the mild asthma talk, is make sure they're doing the basics of their asthma management. So are they actually taking their treatment? Are they taking it properly? And is, is the reason that their asthma is not being controlled because actually they've got a persistent exposure that's going to make their asthma control bad. For example, if they're sensitized to cats and they've got three cats at home, you know, no matter what you do, it's going to be hard to get on top of their asthma control. So you must do all the basics first and address those. And um, when you address those modifiable factors in about 60% of children, you manage to improve their control and they don't need any more investigations, they don't need any more treatment, <clears throat> and they, they do really well. And they are children that we would call um, dif have difficult asthma, difficult to treat asthma. But then there's another group who, despite you doing everything to address the underlying modifiable factors, have continued poor control, and they would be the ones that we would call true severe treatment resi resistant asthma. But there's a third group that I find a real struggle. And they are the ones who, you know they're not taking their treatment or you know they've got three cats at home and they're really sensitized to cats, but they won't remove the cats. And so you know that there are underlying modifiable factors, but despite your absolute best efforts, they just, they won't do what you tell them or you can't, you can't address the modifiable factors. And so they are a group who we call refractory difficult asthma, and they are actually at really high risk of asthma death because they're not doing what you tell them. And so I think both of these groups should be considered for biologics, the ones where you know they've got really severe disease, but the ones also where despite your best efforts, you're not able to address the modifiable factors um, and you know they're at high risk of asthma death. Well, you can't just, you can't let them die. They, you've got to give them a, a treatment that's given directly observed in hospital, and that's a biologic, okay. So how do you decide which biologic? Well, if you wanna know whether a biologic's gonna work, you need to know what's going on in the airways um, of children with severe asthma. And we've shown really consistently that the one thing that characterizes the majority of children with severe asthma is a persistent steroid resistant airway eosinophilia. So despite high dose treatment with inhaled steroids, no matter where you look, whether you look in the bronchovular lavage, whether you look in a biopsy in the airway wall, or whether you look in the sputum, they've all got loads and loads of eosinophils there, okay? So if they've got loads and loads of eosinophils there, will they go away if you give high enough dose of, of inhaled uh, of steroids? So if you give systemic steroids, then, what you find actually, so we gave children with severe asthma an intramuscular injection of triamcinolone. And we, four weeks later, we assessed them. So what happens if you give a high systemic dose of steroids? Well, the exhaled nitric oxide comes down, their asthma control does improve, their symptom score goes up and their exacerbations do reduce. So if you give a high enough dose at systemically, these kids do get better. 
The problem is you can't keep giving systemic steroids, right? Because these are children, they're growing, the side effects are going to be untenable because this, you know, this is kind of, you, you can't just keep giving 10, 15, 20 milligrams of prednisolone every day or recurrent trimsinolone injections. It's just not feasible. So the one thing that happens in these children is that the IL-5 levels in the AOA do go down. Interestingly, the eosinophils stay up. That's really interesting, don't know why, but IL-5 levels do go down. So if that's happening and there's some clinical improvement, then maybe actually the biologic we should be thinking about in these patients is methalizumab. What is methalizumab? Well, it's an antibody that blocks the action of IL-5. And what does IL-5 do? Well, it regulates the growth, recruitment, activation, and survival of eosinophils. So it really reduces all those um, inflammatory cells from coming into the airways. It is licensed for use in children age six and above. But what we really don't know is what are the biomarkers of response for children. And don't forget omelizumab, okay? It's been licensed for several years. We know it's safe and we know it works. So how does it compare to omelizumab? I think that's a really important question. So some of these questions were asked by the ERS ATS task force who have generated guidelines for the management of severe asthma and they've included the evidence for both children and adults. And one of the first questions that they asked was should an anti-IL-5 antibody, mepolizumab, be used in adults and children with severe asthma? And the answer was an anti-IL-5 strategy should be used in adults with severe uncontrolled eosinophilic asthma. It's a conditional recommendation. It's not the highest quality evidence, but there's evidence. But for children unable to make a recommendation, there are no data, not enough data to say whether, not, whether or not children should be given mepolizumab, despite the fact that it's licensed for use. And this is gonna be my mantra again and again and again, that the, the data and evidence for use of biologicals in children is really, really poor, especially anti-IL-5 treatments. So yes, it's licensed for use in children aged six and above, but actually we only have data for children aged between 12 and 17. How many? 37. So based on data from 37 children, only aged between 12 and 17, this drug has been licensed for everyone aged six and above. There is no efficacy data for six to 11 year olds, but both the FDA and European Med Medicines Agency have approved it. This is the data that's available for adolescents. And you can see here that 37 of over 1800 of the total patients in the mepolizumab studies were children. Really, really poor numbers. The thing that distinguished children from adults is that children were much more likely to be atopic Severe asthma in children, atopic allergic eosinophilic phenotype, by far and away the most common, only half of the adults had that phenotype. This is the data for the adolescents. And in each of these, the top box with the error bars shows the data for children. And you can see quite clearly that the error bars are crossing um, the, the, the non-significance uh, line, right? For each of the trials, whether you look at the meta-analysis or the two trials, men's and Musker individually. Now I accept this might be because the numbers were low, but my question then is why aren't we not doing it with higher numbers and with the right age range? Why aren't we doing this trial in children to make sure it really does work? So the worries are that there are no studies, appropriate studies of efficacy in children and certainly none in age six to 11 that I know of. And we really have no idea about the biomarkers that are the right ones for children and you know, how are we gonna decide this? So the ERS and ATS task force did ask about biomarkers for anti-IL-5 therapies. And they looked at the data for excel nitric oxide, blood or sputum eosinophils and serum periostin. And they were able to make a recommendation that for adults, you can use blood eosinophils as a biomarker. No recommendation for children or adolescents. And GINA say that you should use mepolizumab if blood eosinophils are at least 300. The ERS ATS task force said at least 150, but nothing for children and adolescents. 
So what are we doing in the UK? Well, our um, NICE, uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK, says we can prescribe mepolizumab for any child above the age of six if they've got blood eosinophils of at least 300 and four exacerbations in the previous year, or blood eosinophils of at least 400 and three exacerbations in the previous year. But the blood eosinophils can be at any time in the previous 12 months. So when do you measure them? Do you measure them a week before you want to start? Do you measure them six months before you want to start? Do you measure them five times until you get the number you want? We've got no idea about stability of blood eosinophils over time in children. And the reason that's important is this is data from adults. They, these were adults who were in a placebo arm of an anti-IL-5 trial. And you can see the pink here in the pie chart were the adults that had blood eosinophils in the range for the treatment, greater than 300. And the green are the ones that had low blood eosinophils, not in the range for treatment. These were in the placebo arm. So all that happened between this count and the next count was three months of placebo, no other change. But all of the ones that were green became pink, and three quarters of the word, ones that were pink became green. So if you'd measured their blood eosinophils three months later, you would have completely changed whether or not they got treatment. That's for adults. We've got no idea about this in children. And I think it's so important that we look longitudinally to understand how many times we need to perhaps measure the blood count to understand whether a child is ever going to be eligible or not. So moving up and down all the time, it's going to be really difficult to decide how useful blood eosinophils are as a biomarker for children. So that's where we are with mepolizumab and anti-IL-5 antibody therapy. But as I said to you, I really don't think we should forget omelizumab. It's a good biologic. And the one thing that distinguishes children with true severe asthma from those with difficult asthma is their IgE. The ones with really true severe asthma are very, very atopic. They have a higher IgE and they have significantly more allergen sensitization. So omelizumab for them, I think, is a good drug. And in the UK, we can use it for persistent allergic asthma with, um, in children aged six and above who've had at least four exacerbations in the previous year. You have to show evidence of aeroallergen sensitization, but this is the biggest difficulty with omelizumab. The serum IgE range within which you can prescribe it is really limiting for our patients. And that's because so many of them have an IgE higher than the upper limit. But the data for efficacy in children is really good. Systematic review showing you all the data in children. Over 1,300 children were included in the trials showing halving of attacks, but only about 60% of our patients are ever eligible. And if they are eligible and you give it, only about 60% respond. So there's still a big gap after omelizumab. But for me, at the moment, omelizumab is a good drug and it should be used. We've got good efficacy data over a long period of time in children. So to try and understand which child should get which biologic of the two that are currently licensed in the UK, we're doing this trial, which is to look at um, a sort of a head-to-head -head comparison of ovalizumab and mepolizumab in children with severe therapy-resistant asthma and refractory difficult asthma to really work out what are the mechanisms of action of these drugs in children, what are the biomarkers of response, so that we can really be scientific in our decision about who should get which treatment. That's ongoing at the moment. So we've talked about omelizumab and we've talked about mepolizumab, but there's one other drug that's licensed in the US that targets IL-5, and that's benralizumab. Benralizumab targets the IL-5 receptor, okay? So it blocks the receptor. And I've got big, big worries about this because if you block the IL-5 receptor, you deplete all eosinophils in the blood and in the lung, but in all other tissues. And that to me really is concerning, especially for children, because there must be a reason that our eosinophils are there. And as you all know, I'm sure, the normal count for blood eosinophil in a child is higher than in an adult. So there must be a reason those eosinophils are there. And do we really just wanna get rid of them all? I don't think that's right. Um, so 
this is a drug for me that is very scary. It's not licensed in the UK. And if it is licensed, I'm not sure I'm ever going to use it. But um, the data we have is, again, only from adolescents. And 4% of those included in the trial were adolescents. And it showed a very similar efficacy to methylizumab. So if you have high blood eosinophils, you have a good reduction in, in uh, exacerbations. But because I can't see a significant benefit over methylizumab, I'm not sure how much um, benrilizumab adds at the moment for us. So there's one other biologic, which I think is really exciting for children with severe asthma. Re but I find it really frustrating because it's not licensed for use in the UK and it's the one drug I really, really want to use. And that is dupilumab, which is licensed for children aged 12 and above in the US and most parts of Europe, but not in the UK. And what it does is it blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha subunit, which means it blocks the action of both IL-4 and IL-13, which is great because ch these children that have got allergen sensitization, which is where IL-4 is really important. And IL-13 is a type two mediator that drives remodeling and eosinophilic inflammation. So it's a really good drug. If you think about the mechanisms and pathophysiology of severe asthma. So should it be used? Um, the ERS and ATS guidelines say dupilumab should be used for severe eosinophilic asthma. And the nice thing is that it's regardless of blood eosinophils, the efficacy. You don't have to have high blood eosinophils for efficacy. That's really great, but that's adult. Gina says it should be used, um, again, without thinking about blood eosinophils. You don't have to have elevated blood eosinophils, but in the UK, it's not licensed at all yet for adults or children, which is a real shame. But what's really exciting about dupilumab for us as pediatricians is a trial has now been done in children with moderate to severe asthma, a randomized controlled trial. So unlike the IL-5 biologics, it's really been looked at, being looked at in children properly. And these data were presented at the ATS earlier this year. It was the VOYAGE study, which included children aged six to 12 who had moderate to severe asthma and were uncontrolled. Now, the only disadvantage of dupilumab is it has to be given too weekly. But for some children, omelizumab is too weekly as well. So it's not too bad. The primary outcome was um, asthma attacks. And these are the data. Um, and you can see there were good numbers of children included. And they split the groups into those that had high blood eosinophils versus those that didn't. And regardless, there was almost a halving, if not more, of annualized asthma attacks, which I think is really, really encouraging. And there was an effect on lung function improving, which is really, really encouraging. So I think this is, this is gonna be exciting um, for children with severe asthma. Okay, so what have we talked about? We've talked about omelizumab, the IL-5 blockers, IL-4 receptor alpha blocker. There's one more new kid on the block just recently out, and that is tezepilumab, which blocks the action of TSLP. What's TSLP? Well, it's an inflammatory cytokine that's released directly from the epithelium without any adaptive immunity. You don't need T cells, you don't need dendritic cells. Just the inhaled exposures on the bronchial epithelium result in the release of this cytokine, which then results in downstream type two responses. So it's theoretically right at the top um, of the level of cytokines. So it should be great. So this trial was published just a couple of months ago and the title got me really excited because it says the effect of tezepilumab in adults and adolescents with severe asthma. So the title had adolescents in it. So I thought this must have a good number of patients in it, unfortunately not. So the age range was 12 to 80, so that's great. And you only needed two exacerbations in the previous year to be eligible, which is also great. Um, and it was regardless of blood eosinophils, which is really nice. Over a thousand patients, and it's given four weekly subcutaneously. So I was looking through the manuscript. Where are the adolescents? How many adolescents did they have? The only thing you get in the main manuscript is the mean age of all patients, and the mean age is 50. So if your range is 12 to 80 and your mean is 50, you're kind of thinking there's not many adolescents here. So I kept looking and looking. The first thing I found in the main manuscript are the overall results of all patients. And certainly the overall results show a reduction in attacks 
with tezapilumab. And that's regardless of blood eosinophils, regardless of XL nitric oxide, and also, interestingly, regardless of allergen sensitization. So that makes it an interesting drug. And then you have to plow through the supplementary, and finally, you find the number of adolescents that were included. 41 of the patients who got tezapilumab were aged between 12 and 17. And as you can see, Yes, it's to the left of the dotted line, but it crosses the dotted line. Now, again, I accept this may just be small numbers, but look at the adult data for over 65. It's well to the left of the dotted line, and those numbers are small. So I'm just a bit worried about the efficacy of this drug in adolescents and in children. We've tried to look for TSLP in our patients repeatedly, and we haven't been able to. That might be because we just haven't had the right reagents and the right way to measure it. But, you know, again, I don't think this drug is ready for children um, and adolescents, and I don't think it should be extrapolated, the data. But, you know, at the moment, licensing is happening by extrapolation, and that really upsets me. A final thing I wanted to talk about is that, especially that group with refractory difficult asthma and the fact that they just don't want to take their treatment and they probably won't even come to hospital for their treatment because they're feeling well and they can't be bothered. So what we know about children with severe asthma is they undoubtedly tend to ex have exacerbations in the autumn. This is usually a huge peak, isn't there, in the autumn in every country. So why don't we just use it for a short period? That will make it cheaper and it's much more likely to um, increase adherence, especially for that difficult group. And that's what this study did. I think this is a really nice study. Uh, just given pre-seasonal omelizumab uh, to see if that's enough to reduce attacks in school-aged children. This was the Inner City Asthma Consortium, uh, double-blind placebo-controlled child in children of six to 17 years. And they had a four-month intervention, so only four months, not all year round, of either omelizumab or an increase in dose of inhaled steroids or placebo. And it was all children across the whole range from mild up to severe step five. And there was an improvement or a reduction in attacks uh, regardless of the severity of asthma actually, but the best effect was seen in the children who had severe disease. So I think this is something we need to think about. This data hasn't been reproduced. I think it needs to be reproduced, not just with omelizumab, with other biologics, with mepilizumab. Because I think for children, especially when we don't know about the long-term effects of biologics, children don't want injections and cost, I think this, this might be a nice way to go um, and we need to pursue this. And for omelizumab, it seemed to be efficacious because it reduced um, rhinovirus infection and rhinovirus illness. So there's a mechanistic interaction between IgE and rhinovirus, which was probably the reason for this effect, but you know, it, it needs to be looked at, I think, again. Okay, so in summary, how do I approach this? What are my choices? What's my first, second, and third choice? Well, in the UK, um, if I have a patient who is eligible for omelizumab, that's my first choice. If the child isn't eligible, or after a four month trial, they haven't responded, um, in the UK, I can't do this, but if I was in an ideal world, I would choose dupilumab because I think that's showing real promise. We've got pediatric data and, you know, just mechanistically, I think this makes sense. So first, omelizumab, if they're eligible, if they're not eligible or they don't respond, go for dupilumab. At the moment, this is what I have to use second in the UK because it's the only other biologic license, but my third choice would then be mepilizumab. If dupilumab doesn't work or the child isn't eligible or there's something, they don't want two weekly injections because the advantage of mepilizumab is you can give it four weekly. I would not use benvolizumab in children. I'm really worried about it. And tezapelumab, which I don't think we have the data to use it yet um, in children, but I'm sure it'll be licensed soon, but I, I'm too skeptical about it for its use just yet. And that's it. Um, I hope that was helpful.